Please start, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And yes, you've probably all met me a little bit now as you've been, uh, some of you have been trying to install our software. So um, the previous talk was talking about the Rhizome Store and Forward system. Um, what I'm now talking about is one use of that um, that has uh, some quite profound uh, applications, we think. So before we get started, first, you know, who am I? I mean, you've met me over the last little while. Um, so I'm the person who started the, uh, the Serval project. So after the Haiti earthquake, we had, had this realisation and have started to gather the team. Um, since then, I've uh, been appointed a uh, Shuttleworth Telecommunications Fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation and also hold a fellowship in Rural, Remote and Humanitarian Telecommunications at Flinders University, uh, where we're based. Um, but I didn't write this talk. Um, Corey Wallace, uh, who's one of the people working on our team who is uh, doing his honours year, uh, actually doing a project with us uh, and then intending to go on to a, a PhD, all things going well, um, actually did the bulk of the work that, we're talking, that I'll be talking about here uh, and prepared this presentation. Uh, Corey, unfortunately, is unable to be here this week, so I'm presenting in his stead. And uh, the third author on the paper, uh, Romana Challens, um, is currently in Florida trying to convince the, uh, the IEEE 802.11 working group that ad hoc needs fixing and that they actually do really want to fix it. Um, so she also regrettably is, uh, is unable to be here. So what we really want to go through, I'll give a, a very brief introduction to the Serval project because many of you were here for the previous talk and if you weren't able to catch that talk then you know, these talks will go up online and so you can uh, watch uh, the talk that Jeremy Lakeman uh, delivered which gives more of an introduction or some of the other material that we've put out. So I'll talk a little bit about the Serval software itself. Then I want to spend a bit of time talking about Ushahidi, which is um, quite an interesting crowdsourced application that has already had a, a number of uses in uh, adverse settings and how that's an inspiration for what we've done with mapping, but also how we've realised there are some challenges with Ushahidi uh, that need to be addressed. I'll then talk about the specific research question that Corey set about uh, solving. Uh, talk about the prototype software he built to answer that research question, uh, the challenges and future directions that have come up from that. So the, uh, you know, the very quick introduction to Serval, as Jeremy said, we uh, started in 2010 after the Haiti earthquake. Um, myself and Romana Challenge were kind of the first two people uh, running with it with an uh, exchange student from France. And we've kind of built up on that, really pursuing this goal that communications, in fact, is a human right. In fact, this has been... Uh, you know, it's implied in the, uh, the wording of the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1949. But since then, in fact, correspondence within the UN has made it quite clear that uh, they actually see that you know, access to communications, in fact, is a fundamental human right. And we see that that human right should be upheld to the maximum extent possible, uh, not merely in peace times and not merely in, uh, in wealthy countries, and wealthy populations, but that actually, in fact, for everyone, everywhere, uh, in any time or circumstance. And to do that, we really need to make things that can work without infrastructure, because infrastructure is fragile, and when we're dependent on infrastructure, uh, that actually adds a huge cost to the provision of service as well. And ultimately, you know, we were based in at Flinders University uh, in Adelaide. So. The very quick introduction, which again, many of you will probably already kind of have the understanding, that we allow telephony with, uh, with Android-based mobile phones at this stage, but we're planning to, uh, to expand to Symbian and other platforms down the track, uh, without access to any external infrastructure. So you know, here on this slide, you can see four people, and you know, one person is calling the person at the far end, and the, call, the phones along the way are actually relaying that call uh, in practice, actually, without the people actually needing to know, and the phone can be in their pocket or wherever. So that's the concept that we're trying to pursue. Okay, Ushahidi. How, how many people here know about the Ushahidi project? Uh, okay, none of you. Excellent. It, 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 Jeremy knows. Okay, so excellent. So I can tell you about something that you don't yet know about. So. Uh, Yushahidi, the word, literally just means uh, testimony in Swahili. So what it, you know, technically what it is, is a crowdsourced, uh, geotagged um, information system so that incidents can be pinned onto a map and do some clustering and visualisation so that people can see a view of what people on the ground think is happening in some context. So what it was created for uh, initially was actually uh, post-election violence in Kenya. 
so they could actually map out where the violence was happening and presumably people could avoid it and authorities could deal with it. And you know, it's available for mobile phones and there's SMS gateways for you, Shahidi, and you know, it's really quite a, a nice uh, platform for doing various things. So let's have a look at some other places where it's been used. So the, uh, the great earthquake in Japan um, late last year, uh, it's being used quite extensively there to, uh, to map uh, various things. And as you can see, you know, the spots on the map, because they're all geotagged, and then things are uh, clustered together so that people can get a, a little bit easier an idea. And you can just see from where the size of the blobs are, uh, where the places are that you probably don't want to be booking a holiday in Japan still. Um, another place that has been used, um, elections in Liberia, in Africa. And you know, traditionally, Ushahidi's kind of been associated with, uh, with disasters or emergencies. And you know, it seems that almost any election anywhere in Africa ends up being both a disaster and an emergency in various ways, um, which is, is quite sad. But hopefully these tools can actually start to help control and minimise the impact on the, uh, the regular people that are, are in these places. Uh, so here's one that's a little bit different, harassment in Egypt. This is a, a map of data put together by women living in Egypt saying where they're getting sexually harassed. So you can see there's a number of hot spots where, you know, if you're a woman presumably walking home at night or even during the day, quite likely, uh, that you don't want to be. And you can kind of, you know, there's the timeline at the bottom, you can get an idea of, you know, when things are happening as well. So Ushahidi in its short existence has already proven to be a tremendously useful application in addressing disasters and emergency situations of various kinds. But there are some challenges. Fundamentally, it needs the internet because you need a way to get these messages from the phones, maybe via a cellular network, and then there has to be some backhaul where it goes through to um, the server. And then people on the ground actually need to be able to get the data, uh, most typically about where they are. And so you know, there's this centralised single server and you know, there are some fragilities that come in with that. And say if you wanted to go, okay, I'm going to get that, you know, the screenshot, say of the harass map, and I want to now distribute that to, you know, all the women in, uh, in Cairo, for instance. Uh, you've, you've actually got a problem. Um, the Google Maps copyright, because Ushahidi uses Google Maps for the displays, uh, doesn't allow you to redistribute the, uh, the data. So you go, well, this is a bit of a nuisance. Um, it also means that you can't um, cache map data and kind of share it around locally. Uh, you kind of, you're stuck with this going right back to the base to get the data. And in many of these situations, um, you know, well, to put it another way, an, an oversupply of bandwidth is not something you normally would associate with the events that Ushahidi is actually designed uh, to improve. So there is a problem there. So this got us all thinking. So when Corey and I sat down, we thought, okay, what is the research question that we want to answer? And we brought it simply down to this. Is it possible to provide a collaborative map, um, mapping services like Ushahidi on mobile devices in an infrastructure independent manner? And there are three key points that we really want to draw out from this. Uh, the first is you know, collaborative mapping and what that actually means. Um, what do we mean by mobile devices? And ultimately, what do we really mean by infrastructure independent? Because if we don't quantify these, we actually can't answer the research question. And it just helps us with our thinking generally. So let's start with collaborative mapping. So we went for, we wanted a simple proof of concept, and this is if you do the, uh, the scavenger hunt uh, later on the, uh, the conference here, this is exactly what you'll be using. So there are four things. Uh, you can see yourself on the map. Um, you can add points of interest or incidents onto a map, and they'll be pinned on the map and you can you know, see where they are. Uh, you'd like to be able to see where other people are, and you'd like to be able to see the points of interest that other people pin on the map. So that was kind of our criteria of minimum functionality for a, uh, a viable collaborative mapping system. And mobile devices, we thought, okay, well, I mean, technically a mobile device means something that you can move around. Um, we've got a, a Sun Blade 8000 in the lab, which technically can be moved around. Um, we also have a whole pile of custom development kits and things laying around, but that's not really what we mean by mobile. We mean ubiquitous hardware. It needs to be something you can buy off the shelf and work with today. So this uh, fine gentleman on the screen um, has a, a lovely camera. Um, it happens to be a mobile camera for that matter too. Um, but that's probably not the kind of thing that we want to target. Instead, we want 
something ubiquitous. So we went with the, uh, the Android platform, which of course was dictated by that being the, the primary platform for uh, serval at this point in time as well. So that's mobile devices. So infrastructure independent, we've already kind of touched on all the elements of this already, that anything other than the phones itself um, must not be relied on because you may not actually be in a place where you can do it. And this doesn't actually just apply to disasters and uh, emergencies. I mean, here we are, I suspect we wouldn't have to go very far out of Ballarat and there would actually be areas where there would be, uh, you know, mobile black spots um, and great difficulty even getting high-speed ADSL. And certainly, if we go back home to South Australia, 14 kilometres from the centre of Adelaide, a, a population uh, 1.5 million in that city, 14 kilometres out, and there are areas where um, you have the choice of satellite or dial-up internet. So these are issues that affect great parts of the population, let alone going to, you know, to Africa and Asia and many areas where you know, there are billions of people who don't have access to the internet yet. But we want to give them these, the social and economic benefits that come from being able to connect. So this means that downloading the map information and sharing the points of interest and location data must be done in a fully distributed manner. And so that was uh, what was said about. So then in terms of the, uh, the prototype, um, it was indeed created. Uh, Corey did a fantastic job in the, uh, the limited time available for an honest project. And he's made a, uh, an application which we'll see some screenshots of shortly that lets you create points of interest on the map. It shows where you are on the map. It shows where other people are on the map. It can run on Android phones and it can work in complete isolation. So some of the places that we've actually tested the serval software um, to you know, slightly hyperbolically to prove this, uh, we've gone to the top of the Flinders Ranges in the outback of South Australia to the Arkarula Wilderness Sanctuary, um, nearest phone tower, 130 kilometres away. Um, there is satellite internet if you want to, uh, to make use of the, uh, the two metre dish uh, that's up there. Uh, we've also gone about 300 metres underground in Tasmania, under a mountain, in a hydroelectric power station, where, again, getting a mobile phone signal or uh, you know, terrestrial internet access uh, is uh, slightly difficult. Um, I mean, they do have a subterranean uh, internet connection there, but we weren't making use of that. And we've also been in completely undeveloped caves, you know, 90 metres into a riverbank, and uh, quite happily making calls uh, in and out of the cave. So we're quite happy that we've, uh, we've got infrastructure independence and one of the key things that we actually had to do for this project was wean ourselves off of the convenience of the Google Maps API. So we're using uh, OpenStreetMap data instead which has much uh, more liberal uh, licensing terms and that enabled us to do the entire solution such that phones could actually share and cache data to one another. So in terms of the, uh, the point of interest life cycle, so in where the, the user currently is, there's a, um, you know, a transient point of interest that shows where the person is. The data gets stored locally on the device. The device then sends out periodic UDP packets to any other no neighbours on the mesh who then go, ah, OK, I'll now cache that locally and that's now available for me to rebroadcast out. And likewise, with, with the map updates, we use the Rhizome service that Jeremy talked about to uh, get the latest versions of maps. And we can actually transparently and automatically update maps uh, in the field. Or, for instance, if you were travelling, pardon me, from one place to another, and you might have you know, the maps for, say, you know, South Africa, for instance, and you come here to Australia and you go, OK, I don't have any local maps. With this service, it can automatically copy the maps from someone nearby onto your phone. And apart from the fact that it's just kind of cool and it means that you don't pay cellular data services, one of the really interesting things is that when you think about the way Ushahidi works, the data you most care about is the most local data. It's actually the easiest data to share amongst people, uh, which is different to some other applications, but it, it's worked really in our favour. And basically, you know, we update the, the points of interest on the map and spread that amongst the nodes and they spread them on. And so everyone gets a view which is eventually consistent. Uh, it doesn't guarantee consistency at any point. But given that the alternative is having uh, absolutely no data, we think this is a, a pretty good improvement. So let's have a look at a, an example screenshot here. So this was uh, some testing back in uh, home in Flinders University. So there's a point of interest. They have a, a nice little yellow blob. Uh, there's someone else uh, with a, another phone. They show up in red and yourself shows up in blue. And uh, you can then add you know, 
new incident. So if we click on that incident, we'll actually see a display that has the text of the incident. And it gives you the phone number on the mesh of the person who left that incident. So if they're actually reachable on the mesh, you could actually give them a call or you could potentially send them a text and say, oh, look, you know, I, I can't find the incident report center. Where is it? And then they might text back. And again, that relay can all happen by Rhizome that Jeremy was talking about earlier as well. Uh, so we have a, a title and we have the, uh, the description and the, the phone number which we've talked about. And, yeah, and the, the age of uh, information. So in fact, the, our current barrier to, uh, to getting the scavenger hunt underway is that we actually uh, have a, a filter in for our testing purposes that was uh, filtering out old incidents. So we're going to turn that filter off so that the, uh, the incidents that we've put in today will be available for the rest of the week uh, and easily viewable. A little note on the map symbology. Um, we basically got three different types of symbols on the map. We started out with something simple and we wanted it simple so that we could do it in the time frame and that it wouldn't be overly confusing. We know that we need to improve it and we certainly intend to do that. So we might have, you know, a density of colour might indicate the age, for instance, and you know, have different shapes for different things. So, you know, someone might say there's free food somewhere and so we might have, you know, a, a hamburger icon or, you know, we can look at all of those kinds of things um, at our leisure now that we've got the, the core up and working and we intend to try and think reasonably carefully about that so that it's as usable to people and avoids confusion as we add uh, further details in there. And one of the, the key things in that uh, for the long term is actually having some sense of trust uh, and authority so that you can kind of go well if someone I know says that something is somewhere I'm more likely to trust them rather than you know, some random stranger or if it's you know, someone that you consider to be untrustworthy says that you go well actually maybe I really believe quite the opposite of what they're claiming. And also we need to do that clustering like you Shahidi does so that the map doesn't get unduly cluttered. So OpenStreetMap data is what we're using for the, for the maps and so the map gets stored locally on the, uh, on the phone. This avoids the copyright issues with Google or using any other source. And we're using a fairly compact binary format that's then quite easy for us to, to distribute around using the, uh, the Rhizome service. And in the long term, what we're actually planning to do is to set up a, um, a regular process that will actually build map tiles for everywhere in the world. And so if a phone does happen to have an internet connection at some point and wants the map for the area where it is, then it can actually fetch it and then start sharing that uh, with others around. Uh, which would be quite nice and scalable. So we shouldn't actually need you know, a crazy level of infrastructure because it won't have every person in the world needing to fetch map data off us on a regular basis, or at least that's our hope. So in terms of the, all of these things together in the prototype, so the initial testing that we've had has been positive and we would uh, look forward to hearing uh, the feedback from those of you here if you have a chance to participate in the, uh, the scavenger hunt as well. And we are continuing uh, development with it, even literally today. Uh, to add in some of these more advanced features and uh, take advantage of what else is happening in the uh, the Serval project, and I mean some of those main things are the uh, our new um, mesh MS, um, the mesh short messaging service that we uh, we have in the, the newer builds of uh, the Serval software, and as we're beginning to put security in everything, we'll revamp the message format so that we can actually have the uh, you know, secured messages uh, and that trust and authenticity are built in. So in terms of challenges we're facing at the moment, one of the fascinating ones that we've found, I mean, we had someone talking earlier about the, uh, the power consumption of being on a mesh, which is typically higher than being on a, a cellular network. One of the, the big issues when you start using a meshed phone to do geolocation work is that suddenly you've got the two most power consuming um, elements of the, uh, the phone running at the same time. You've got the GPS receiver and you've got the, uh, the Wi-Fi radio uh, on all the time. And again, if you have no internet access, you can't get AGPS data. So that means that you may take seven minutes to get a fix. And what's worse is some of the GPS implementations don't, uh, after they've got a fix, they actually don't keep the Almanac data um, if they haven't downloaded it from the internet. You know, like the satellites somehow aren't as trustworthy as the, uh, the internet, which gets it off the satellites and then feeds it through. Um, but uh, such are the entertaining challenges that we find. What we'd really love to do, and uh, if anyone feels like some uh, work in exploring how various uh, GPS receivers work, we would love to be able to get the Almanac and the Ephemeris data out of a running GPS receiver on an Android phone and package it into the format that is normally used for the AGPS download. Because the one thing there is, is an API to then inject that into a GPS receiver and we can share it on the mesh. 
So what that does is it cuts your fixed time down to about six seconds. What that means is that you can turn the GPS on periodically and get a fix, say, every 30 seconds in return for about 20% of the power of keeping it on the whole time, because otherwise if the GPS doesn't have the AGPS data available and it's one of these silly GPS receivers that forgets uh, when and where it is unless the, uh, the internet has told it so, then you basically have to leave the GPS receiver on the whole time unless you only want location updates every 10 to 15 minutes because it will take you seven minutes to, to get the fix. So this is something that we're, we're working on. Um, the, uh, the test phones that we've been using for the Serval project um, are these uh, lovely Huawei IDEOS um, and IDEOS X1 phones. Uh, we use them quite shamelessly because they're cheap and they're actually a fully functional Android phone uh, here in Australia for like $79 network lock, which is great. Um, unfortunately, a Commodore 64 has more pixels on the screen um, than these phones have. It's the, uh, the one trade-off that you get uh, that's a bit of an issue. So making the UI actually fit in that space is, uh, is something quite problematic. And also, as many people who've tried to program on Android would be able to testify, uh, in particular, user interface uh, management in Android uh, is not the most pleasant experience in the world. Uh, and Apple are probably very, very happy indeed that uh, that's the case. So these are some of the issues that uh, we're facing. So. Looking forward, um, there's a number of things that are kind of coming up. I mean, we're looking at uh, you know, later this year in the first half of the year actually working with a, a humanitarian relief organisation out of New Zealand uh, to actually try using our mapping service and a number of other our services to, uh, to support, um, you know, to see how that can fit in with their workflow. And so we'll be participating as, uh, as observers uh, in that exercise and seeing if people can uh, make effective use of our technology. But also, um, the combination of the mapping and rhizome and all of these things um, is gaining interest for environmental monitoring and sensor networks because it provides a really simple, robust way you can just kind of throw the devices out, they can get their GPS location, they can pin the data on the map, and any device in the area can actually collect the data. And in fact, actually, for the civil project as a whole, this is one of the, uh, the compelling advantages uh, compared to a number of other approaches that have been tried in this space that basically. And, you know, and those that have got the software on the phones uh, will hopefully have discovered by now that you get the software on the phone, you go, oh, look, I can now just ring people and it, it just works. And all of the, uh, the network config and all of that uh, kind of mess happens behind the scenes. We also want to integrate, um, if you like, our offline infrastructure independent you shahidi like service with the real thing because we think that combination actually has uh, tremendous potential value. So, you know, you might be in, you know, in Egypt somewhere, you might not have any credit on your phone and so you can't send the text message through to the thing to, to report harassment. But it'd be really nice if you can actually report that on your phone and have that trickle through the mesh somewhere until eventually it can get back to the server. Or in fact, you might come into cellular coverage yourself later on and it can then uplink directly. Uh, and then of course, you know, there's the age old open issues with crowdsourcing in terms of, you know, how can you really tell what data is trustworthy and, you know, and authority and all of these sorts of questions. So these are things that we're looking at. And I've already mentioned it briefly, but we're planning uh, in this coming uh, few months, uh, Corey uh, will be working on uh, taking the entire, I think it's 73 gigabytes uh, world uh, map file uh, from OpenStreetMaps and actually automating the entire process of slicing and dicing that up into the little nice pieces that we can put on the phones uh, and having the, uh, the structure for that. So that will be a, a, a nice data management exercise uh, for him to do. Uh, and we'll keep the supercomputer in our department quite busy. So in conclusion, um, you know, the research question has been answered in the affirmative. We actually have managed to get collaborative mapping happening on mobile devices with complete infrastructure independence. And we're not aware of anyone else actually having uh, achieved that. So we're really very happy with, the, with that. And you know, it works. There are further things that we can work on, uh, which is great. And we're getting, we're really actually quite excited about being able to, over the next few months, start trying to use this in at least real training exercises and find out what things we need to fix so that it can actually start helping people and saving lives ultimately. And really just you know, helping to support that objective that you know, access to communication and information um, are universal human rights. And so you know, we want to support that. 
So if you want more information, uh, feel free to take a picture of the QR code and frame it at home or whatever you would like to do with it. Um, there's website addresses there. You can uh, join the, uh, the developer mailing list and find out the, uh, the latest uh, bleeding edge things. Um, in the spirit of, uh, of openness, uh, Corey's thesis is actually up there. You can download it and read it. It's, uh, it's quite accessible. And uh, other than providing due credit for the, uh, the images in the talk, uh, which we'll, everyone's read everyone's credits, good. Okay, there's a the QR code. Um, I think that's uh, all I need to say. Now, if anyone has any questions, that would be uh, excellent. Oh yes, yes, yes. That's right. So uh, Rob's just saying because a number of you in the break before this talk uh, installed our software and are using Rhizome, and uh, yes, files are popping up uh, everywhere. Any device any, on the prototype Rhizome software, and it is a proof of concept prototype. Anything that you put up there will end up on every other phone on the mesh uh, eventually. So uh, you may wish to be selective and uh, yeah, exercise appropriate judgment with what you put there, and have particular care to uh, you know, that you're not infringing copyrights. comment is that um, OpenStreetMaps um, lacks data on some areas, for instance, where there's been hurricanes or earthquakes, where Google Maps actually has much more extensive uh, data. No, I'm not suggesting that Google does. I'm saying that OpenStreetMaps doesn't. And I just think it's, I just want to point out yeah. that it's a liability to the Yeah, sure. So, so just, yeah, continuing on this, you know, the, the, I mean, there, there is a difference in coverage between them, and um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, that this is just it's a commentary, it's not a, um, a criticism either way. I mean, ultimately, you know, Google would need to change the copyright license to, and it would be lovely if they did, um, to let the world truly benefit from that information. Um, but also what we've seen, for instance, in Haiti, it took three days for there to go from practically no maps available for Port-au-Prince to it being very thoroughly mapped indeed. So when people um, get together and do this, um, change can happen quite rapidly, which is why we need an automated um, you know, slice and dice the world uh, process. So. For people watching the video, so a further comment about you know there are areas which are unmapped, and with Google Maps and many of the others, the satellite data and commercial map data that they um, use to build their maps can often be incredibly out of date. Um, what it's actually interesting at, a, at an international level during a disaster, if a country hands over control of the disaster response to the United Nations, suddenly all of the satellite providers in the world are basically required to do what they can to acquire completely up-to-date, as high-resolution images as they can and make them freely available for everyone. Uh, so that's what happened in Haiti, which is why it went so fantastically. If in another country where they're not willing to do that, and I mean, this is it's one of these strange international things, like Australia wouldn't hand over control um, during a disaster to the UN, and so we actually wouldn't get as good data as if um, it was Haiti. So there, there's a whole pile of international kind of level things that really could be streamlined to maximise human benefit. I mean, this is the irony that this UN policy is designed to maximise human benefit, and yet there's kind of uh, some holding back. And, but hopefully these things will improve. So now someone else had a question?
um, cycle maps, for example. And so there's a lot more detail in the open street maps on cycleways and cycle maps around the world than you'll ever get on Google Maps because there's no commercial interest in it. Mm -hmm. and, and exactly what happened in Casey, um, people were sitting all over the world and they were getting satellite imagery and they were able to build an open street map, map of Casey quicker than Google was able to. Um, so it, it, it works by ways, but because open street map is an open data source and it's, it's, it's um, Creative Commons licensing, it means that once the work's been done, it's available for anyone to read, it's unlike Google or other commercial open services. Yeah, so um, again, the comment there is that in OpenStreetMap, in these areas where there's lacking data, that people are actually completely free to, uh, to put that in. Indeed, that's what happened with Haiti, and also uh, the comment was that uh, cycle maps around the world are actually way better now in OpenStreetMap typically than in Google because there's no commercial interest for the commercial mapping sources uh, to update that information. But for you know, the average cyclist on the street, it's a very different situation. Suddenly, now they're able to update that data themselves. Yes, so sorry. You're in a disaster area and you need to map the roads or where the disaster areas where there's no risk that your mapping data that you're getting here from your local points of interest couldn't be fed back in your open street map and available to everyone. Correct. So the comment is that people using our software potentially could actually start being contributors into OpenStreetMap. And that's something that we've actually talked about in the lab. And we're trying to think about the best way to do it on the confined resources on the device. But we would absolutely love for people to go, well, the map doesn't go here, but clearly I can walk down this street and. Uh, do all the things. And again, the challenge then is to do it in an infrastructure independent manner, including ideally repackaging up the binary format map file to then share to other people in the local mesh so that people nearby can immediately get the benefit from that improved map. So we had another question in the back corner. Yeah, that's exactly the implication that I was trying to lead towards. Um, the locations I looked at, um, one of them actually is fairly well mapped, and that's because I hired a guy to ride around in a service bus with a GPS in his hand for a week. Um, and so I got my own town mapped. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, this was not at all a criticism of OpenStreetMaps. I love it. I, I prefer it to any other service. But the implication I wanted to, 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 to make is that I think that if you're working in many, many places in the developing world where you're short of a devastating event like the Haiti earthquake, um, you will have to bootstrap your information. Um, yeah. You won't have an alternative. The, one of the places I looked at, um, Gizo in the Solomon Islands, uh, there were villages that were wiped out, but the total death toll was a few hundred, so who knew? Yeah. Except for those of us who knew the people who lived there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, I think it's one of the... Yeah, the great spaces for the world of open to actually make a profound difference in filling in these gaps in the mapping and in areas where it's just, I mean, you know, what's the economic incentive for the commercial world to map you know, some of these places that we're talking about? There isn't any, but suddenly now we can actually, we have the tools to, uh, to do that. And actually, I think one of the, the contributions that the Civil Mapping Service hopefully will provide is that by providing the client side experience that it will increase the, um, you know, the interest and the value for people to actually map these areas. Because I mean, people living in these areas could map it, I mean, they could potentially do it now and upload it to OpenStreetMaps. But what practical benefit does it actually give them on the, uh, the ground now? And hopefully that will begin to change as we, uh, we continue to work on our software. And from a just purely from a service perspective, it's this, you know, there's lots of things in the world that cater for, you know, to be quite blunt, the rich white men of this world. And we want to try and help um, I mean, you know, we don't have a problem with helping rich white men, but we actually want to help all people, regardless of income, regardless of colour, regardless of gender, regardless of political persuasion, regardless of everything. Uh, you know, communications is a human right. We want to help people. We want to alleviate suffering. That's really what we want to achieve. And, yeah. Sorry, question. Hi, um, what's... I suppose, Chris, I want to understand this in terms of just a proof of concept and everything, and obviously you know, the biggest bang for buck to, to demonstrate that. What's the, you know, is a projector obviously to extend other platforms and I suppose yeah. more so, is it going to be a, a splitting of the ways because you are adding more functionality which is obviously great but like, is it under the assumption I suppose that dumb phones are going to completely disappear? Okay, this is a really interesting question. So it's, the, you know, we're currently on Android. Are we looking at other platforms? What about feature phones? All of these sorts of things. Okay. Um, we absolutely want to get as much of serval as we can on you know, like $20 feature phones as we can. Um, and you know, there's a number of things that we need to do to do that effectively because they don't have Wi-Fi. What they do have is that they have, uh, you know, in an ideal happy land, right, 
Uh, what we would do is we would go to you know, the manufacturers of the chipsets, whether it's Qualcomm or Nokia or whoever, and we'd say, uh, we would like to, uh, to you know, get the, uh, the development tool chain, the full documentation set for your baseband processor that is in you know, all of these phones. And they would say, sure, Dr. Gardner Stephen, we'd love to share that with you so that we can help the world. Um, and in the process, actually improve their products and improve their market competitive. This is, you know, it's, there actually is benefit for them in it. And what we would then do is sit down and go, okay, for countries where the ISM 915 unlicensed band sits between the, uh, the two GSM uh, 900 or 850 um, uplink and downlink blocks, um, we'll do a long range meshing, uh, low bit rate protocol over that, which is ideally suited to feature phones. And that potentially would do, you know, like we're here in a, a built up area on a university campus, uh, you should be able to do a single hop call over something like half a kilometre to a kilometre, um, is our, our estimates from the, the link budget analysis. Um, take that into open country and start sticking, you know, phones in this, you know, get a phone with a broken screen, fine, run our software on it, stick it on a, you know, a tall stick on top of your house, and that can act as a relay point and, you know, potentially uh, extend the range out further. So you could probably get, you know, in very ideal conditions, like 10 to 20 kilometres between hops, and we think we can do six to 20 hops uh, fairly readily, suddenly you actually have the potential for a, a regional, um, probably SMS only, um, over the regional scale communications network, but also using things like David Rowe's uh, Codec 2 that we've been eyeing off um, most covetously uh, for a number of months. Um, that you know, means that we can actually start doing voice calls over these kinds of ranges as well. And then you, you, the multi-hop and suddenly you've got a, a really tremendous solution. So we absolutely want to get it on feature phones. All that stands between us and doing that is having enough money to go to a feature phone manufacturer. Um, you know, in the first, because assuming that Qualcomm and the, the Nokia's of the world aren't going to, uh, to, you know, to send me a nice email uh, saying, where can we deliver the package, uh, which we would love for them to do. Um, our plan B is to get a custom-made feature phone that has a, a low-cost uh, 900 megahertz radio or ideally a, a replaceable little radio module on the back of it. So it might increase the cost of the phone by, I don't know, 5 or $10 probably, uh, which is like a 50% increase in price. But the trade-off means that most of the time you don't have to pay for your local SMS. Remember that for most people, most of their communications are less than four kilometres. In the developing world, it's actually even more acutely so because you know, if you live in a, a rural village in the middle of nowhere, you know a few people outside of the village area, but most of your contacts are actually nearby. And the store and forward, that can actually work fantastically as people move between villages literally carrying the phone. Um, you know, they get into, you know, go from village A to village B, and suddenly the phone offloads all the messages for the people living in village B, picks up all the messages from village B for people living in village A, and can deliver it back. Uh, and we can do voicemail and, uh, with, and things with Codec 2 quite efficiently in that space. Um, in the very short term, what we intend to do, resource permitting, and if someone would like to, to take it on, we would love to start porting to the um, Nokia Symbian S60 platform. Um, now, you, a number of you are probably thinking, hang on, Symbian is dead. Nokia have killed Symbian. Uh, yes, what they've now done is they've realised that Windows Phone 7 won't run on the bulk of Nokia handsets for a very long time yet. And so, um, Symbian is dead. A thing that consists of the Symbian source code and a new name is called Bell. Um, and that will be here for some time. And in particularly on the, the feature phones and the, the mid-range kind of phones, um, Symbian is with us, I believe, for a long time to come. And Symbian, you don't need to root the phone to get ad hoc. Um, you can control around it. It's glorious. And there's something like a quarter of a billion Symbian S60 phones out there. Um, it's a, an absolute um, ideal place for us to move because Android phones, quite frankly, actually help more rich white men at the moment than if we were to, uh, to target Symbian. But you know, we could only pick one to begin with and we only had finite resources, so that's the order. But we'd love for someone to, uh, to start attacking that port. or does it kind of every request come back to your phone? The file gets replicated on every node on the network, at the moment, every node on the network, whether or not it wants it. Because that's the way that it will eventually get to the destination that really needs it. So what happens if you run out of disk space? Ah, if you run out of disk space, then uh, what you do is you have a nice uh, reclamation process. So what we're moving forward to is that there'll be groups. So you can say, I care about groups X, Y, and Z, and people that are in those groups can post things, and your phone will prioritise storage for those. 
And it might be that you know that uses up half of your space, and the other half of the space will be for just whatever fluff happens to be floating around. And files typically will be tagged with a geographic bounding box of relevance, so that there's actually a, you know, a, a, a geographic distribution as well. And of course, old files will kind of drop off as well as they get older. But we're, we're open. If anyone has any fantastic ideas on better ways to do that, we'd love to hear as well. Okay. Adding tracking to which files are being viewed? In theory, we could do it because the Rhizome um, store and forward messaging system could actually allow a store and forward message to be initiated to say, I've just viewed file X. We wouldn't want to do that without people's permission because there's obviously a whole pile of uh, privacy issues in there. Okay. Cool. And I think that's all. Uh, so, um, this might be more related to the last talk, but like with the SMSing, um, is there a lifetime when it stops being distributed? Um, it's when your phone decides to stop distributing the thing. So with, um, one of the things the, that we do have in place with the, uh, the file distribution um, in the, the next version that will come out is that small files take priority over big files. So if there are two files that are otherwise deemed equal and one is 10K and the other is 10 meg, um, your phone will throw out the 10 meg one to put the 10K one in. So if you make your message log of outgoing messages too long, without aging off the old ones, you'll have more trouble getting your messages delivered. So there's actually an incentive for you to say, okay, if it's not really important and it's not gone out in three days or whatever, then I'll ditch it. What it also says, if you try and send out spam, uh, you're basically stuffed because your message log will have to be a million miles long um, and then no one will actually copy it because you know, everyone will have much smaller files uh, available uh, that will take priority for the storage. Cool. Sorry if I may. Sorry, yep. If you have a large thing that you need to get to a particular audience, how do you sift important from unimportant? Um, I think that's actually a wide open question. Um, the, you know, there are some things we can do that are sane, that help in that general direction. We're looking at ways to try and channel data in the direction it needs to go, and you know, whether it's addressed to a particular person or not, and all of those sorts of things. But I mean, ultimately, there's finite storage on the phones, there's finite CPU, finite energy. We can't do everything, but we're jolly well going to do as much as we can. Um, Cool, and unfortunately I will have to stop questions at that point. Jeremy will be around for the rest of the conference, but I actually have to drive back to Melbourne now to, uh, to hop on my plane to hop home. So um, apologies for having to cut it short there. Thank you.